Cheers and welcome my friends, I'm Holotrak and this video is part of my EU4 Academy video tutorial series. EU4 is a grand strategy game developed by Paradox that allows you to play any nation on the globe between 1444 and 1821. It's a complex game with lots of different mechanics, so to make this series work it has to be as granular and as focused as possible, which means that aside from the video's topic, not every mechanic we touch on can be fully explained. If you come across a mechanic you don't understand, I recommend browsing the playlist which you find a link to in the video description and now let's get to it. This video will be about choosing a nation and starting a new game. We're going to talk about five things in this video. We're going to talk about the timeline of EU4 and the bookmarks, the various bookmarks that you can choose from. We're going to talk about the country overview and what it tells you about the nation that you're about to choose. We're going to talk about the map modes and how they inform your decision of which country you're going to pick. We're going to talk about the options that you have for a game and we're also going to talk about custom nations and the custom nation designer. So if you go to single player, you'll see tons and tons of different countries that you can select from. The timeline of EU4 is from 1444 until 1821. And across this whole timeline, you'll be able to pick any nation in the world. So if you should fancy playing the Inca or the Aztec over here, you can do that to try to fend off the invaders the european invaders there are tons of countries that you can pick in europe as well and there are some handy bookmarks that de developers have put in here like uh, rise of the ottomans is the standard one 1444 um, paradox said that 99 percent of games are actually being started in 1444 and it's not surprising because this gives you the most time in the game and it also allows you to shape your nation in very profound ways if you go for later start dates some of the ideas of your country will already have been picked and they will have been developed in some form or fashion just like they historically did like if you if you choose um, the netherlands in 1756 these guys will have a colonial empire in the Far East, and there's nothing you can do about it other than give that stuff up, but that's just um, the historical way that the Netherlands developed. Uh, whereas if you start in 1444, you can do almost everything with these countries that you, that you want to do. These bookmarks are centered around various geographical regions. Empires of the Sands gives you interesting nations in Africa to play. The First Nations gives you interesting nations in America, Kingdoms of the East in the East, and so on. And then you have some later bookmarks like the Fall of Byzantium, the Discovery of the Americas in 1492, the War of the League of Cambrai. Um, tons of different interesting bookmarks here. And you always get like a description of why this is an interesting point in time. And also it will recommend you various countries that you can play. So if you select any country, you get this nation overview, and that tells you quite a bit about the nation that you are about to play. If you were to, were to press play right now, we would start playing with Bavaria. Um, so we take it from the top. This shows our government rank. Bavaria is a duchy, which is the lowest rank. There are three ranks, duchy, kingdom, empire. Bohemia over here is a kingdom. And for example, the, the last remnants of the Byzantine Empire are still seen as an empire. This gives you various bonuses like more diplomats and other stuff. It's not a huge thing. You will be able to increase your government rank as well. Don't let that deter you from playing any nation that you want. It's just something that is interesting to know what your country is going to be in terms of government rank. Below that you see the tech group. So Bavaria is in the Western technology group which is going to have the easiest time in the game because it's called Europa Universalis and for a reason. There are other tech groups in the game. So Eastern tech groups Poland for example is Eastern um, Ottomans have their own technology group and then for example the Mesoamerican guys down here <clears throat> are gonna have a tough time so the the um, technology group influences various things like what kind of troops you can use and uh, the spread of institutions all that kind of stuff um, basically making it so that history will slightly or definitely tilt towards the Western technology group, but it is an alternate history simulator. So if you are determined and a good player, you can also try to turn history around and make a strong Mesoamerican nation if you so desire and if you have enough skill. Um, right, so technology group, pretty important. You can see that Bavaria is a Catholic country. The Ottomans down here are a Sunni country. All these different religions have different mechanics associated with them. So it's good to know what um, you're getting. In 1444, almost all of Europe is actually Catholic, as you can see over here. 
Right. We are an independent nation. Not every nation in Europe is actually independent or starts out in 1444 as independent. For example, Sweden is in a personal union under Denmark, which means the Danish ruler rules Sweden as well. And they also rule Norway. Now, Sweden is still playable as an independent nation because in EU4 you play like the spirit of a country and you can try to um, wriggle out of the personal union and get away from Denmark, but uh, being in a personal union means that Sweden cannot declare any wars of its own. It will be pulled into all wars that Denmark declares, and yeah, they're basically a subservient country. Um, Bavaria doesn't have that problem. It is an independent nation. You can see the ruler and his stats. Um, so we have two admin skill, two diplomacy skill, two military skill. These range from one to six, um, six being the best, one being the worst. So Duke Albrecht is um, below average, is not that great. He's not as bad as England's current ruler with zero, 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 because um, he was just exceptionally bad historically. Um, then you can see the technology level. So we start at admin, diplo and military tech three. That is the way for all the European nations. It's not the same for the American nations. These guys uh, start at one, 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 and we'll have to try to catch up to their European counterparts. And then we have the ideas. Each nation or almost each nation has their own national ideas. And these are here to just simulate historic strengths um, that various nations had. So Brandenburg, as they go through the game and they unlock various idea groups, they will um, develop a really, really strong military because uh, they get a bunch of ideas that are geared towards giving them a stronger and stronger military. Holland, for example, will gain ideas that are geared towards having a big trading fleet. Um, Spain will get ideas that are geared towards colonizing, all that kind of stuff. So this is historical flavor and giving each nation sort of a bit of a, an own identity. And then you can see the country size. This is the amount of provinces. You can see Bavaria has five. France, for example, has 27 provinces. This is the development, and this is like a numerical value that counts together all the tax base, all the production in a country, and all the manpower that you can get from the provinces. And this allows you to just compare the sizes of different countries. So you can see Bavaria has 58, France has 347. So you can basically say that France is about six times the size of Bavaria. This is kind of a measurement of difficulty. The higher the development, the easier of a time you're going to have, but it is not necessarily something that should stop you playing a nation and uh, can still be a lot of fun to play a small or middling country, country like Bavaria. And then you have the fort level, which means there might, for example, be a level three and a level two fort in Bavaria protecting its five provinces. This number is just um, interesting if you compare it with the development and province level. You can see that Lithuania has a fort level of nine, which is just four higher than Bavaria, but they have 200 more development and a bunch more provinces than Bavaria. So you can definitely say that Bavaria is way better fortified than Lithuania. Lithuania will have a lot of building up to do. And then in this window, since we're already at Lithuania, this was kind of helpful because it shows us what kind of outstanding um, diplomatic treaties the country has. So for example, they currently have a truce with the Ottomans, it shows you when that truce is going to end. This means they cannot attack the Ottomans if they do not want to suffer some serious repercussions like other nations looking down on them, not being happy at all that they just attacking and breaking treaties. And that's about it for that window. The nation selection screen contains a couple of map modes that will allow you to identify areas of expansion, drawbacks or advantages of various countries that you might want to play or not play. And I will tell you how to do that. So for example, you always start off in the political map mode and this just colors your whole nation in one color. You can see France is a big blue blob over here. Austria is that whitish area, which allows you to see that Sundgau is cut off from main Austria. Uh, you can see Lithuania here, one big blob. It looks like a very homogenous country. If you switch to the terrain map mode, this will show us um, advantages and drawbacks of Lithuania in particular. Lithuania has a bunch of swamp provinces over here in Kaunas and Trakai and Brazda, um, all these areas, and it's also very wooded. Now, this is an advantage and a drawback at the same time. It's going to be difficult to develop swamp and wooded provinces. Costs more, it's more difficult to like increase your farm income, uh, build big cities in swamp areas. So that's a drawback. The advantage is that it's more difficult for attackers to fight in wooded areas 
because you can hide your own troops, your guys normally know the area, all that kind of stuff. So that gives you an advantage, making Lithuania a decently defensible country. If you have mountains like Austria with the Alps and they are able to lure any armies into these mountain provinces, it's going to be a very bad time for any for any attacker. Now, the next one is trade and trade. Um, the trade view that you get in the nation selection screen is actually not complete because it doesn't show how the trade flows from which trade area into which trade area. Uh, so it all only allows you really to just see areas of expansion. Like for example, Denmark over here might want to try and conquer these northern German provinces just to get a bigger hold on the Lübeck trade node and increase its wealth. Um, but yeah, this mode is actually not all that great. I would largely ignore it here and actually use the one in the game. Then you have the religious map mode, and that will actually allow you to identify that Lithuania is in for a troubled time because they have Catholic as their state religion, but they have a huge amount of provinces that are not their state religion, but are instead orthodox. That's why this area is striped. And uh, yeah, that might have all kinds of implications. They have to either be very tolerant or they're going to have rewards from their population. They might try to convert them. Other nations that belong to the Orthodox faith, like Russia or even the Byzantine Empire, if they can get to power, might be inclined to maybe conquer these provinces to get their Orthodox brethren back into the fold. It has all kinds of nasty implications. You can see that the small amount of Catholic population over here in the main Lithuanian area is kind of uh, dwarfed by the huge amount of Orthodox people that they have. So that definitely spells trouble. And uh, yeah, that can that can help you identify various problems in the countries that you are going to play. You can see that these Coptic guys down here, Ethiopia, are surrounded, completely surrounded by Muslim countries. So they're going to have a very hard time. Whereas in Europe, Catholic nations are going to find it easy to ally with other Catholic nations, all that kind of stuff. Okay, we have the Imperial map mode that shows you which countries belong to the Holy Roman Empire and what kind of role they play. Austria is the emperor, it's purple. These guys are electors, they select the emperor. Whenever an emperor dies, they select the new one. So they are orangish. Um, we have the three cities of the empire, which have to be only exactly one province, but uh, have certain bonuses for development and stuff, like Nuremberg over here. And then you have the normal states in green and the striped states are states that are under control of a nation that is not in the empire, which has certain negative implications for the imperial authority and the emperor. And the emperor might try to actually conquer these provinces back, which means that if you're playing the Teutonic Order, um, this map mode will make you aware that you're actually controlling a part of the empire without being in the empire, making you a potential target for being attacked by the emperor, all that kind of good stuff. The diplomatic view will show you certain relations between countries. Burgundy is actually a good example for that. Not only is it holding imperial provinces with Cambrai, Hainaut and Namur, down here, but it also is actually stronger than it shows on the map. So the green provinces are its main mainland, but it's also controlling Nevers down here, uh, which is a vassal, and it's controlling Holland, Flanders and Brabant. So it's actually quite a bit bigger than the 144 development that is being suggested, because it also gets the development, uh, the 45 development of Holland, the 34 of Flanders, the 53 of Brabant, and the 27 of Nevers. So it is like looser, more loosely organized than something like France, which just has a ton of development on its own. But it's also not as weak as that 144 development would suggest because it has all these diplomatic relations. Same is true for Denmark, 128 development, but controls Sweden and Norway. And there are a couple of others. Poland, for example, has Mazovia and Moldavia as its vassals and marches. So that is something to look out for. There's a development thing. Um, I already told you what development is. And this allows you to see the provinces with the highest developments. Milan currently is the highest one in 1444. 30 development, 11 base text, 11 production, 8 manpower. We'll get into that in the development tutorial video. But for now, you just should just know the higher the development, the, uh, the better. So playing as Milan, you will have a very, very beefy capital city. Various provinces are pretty big. Florence has 28. Rome has 28, Venice has 27, Paris 23, London is 20, and then as you go up north, less and less development. Bohemia has 19 in Prague, Vienna has 21, 
There's 23 in the capital. So basically the capitals are decently developed, but as you go up north, you see no way it's all red, like no development up here. These just are very, very poor areas at this point in time. Right, and then you have the regions, which is not a hugely useful thing. Like you might consider conquering in, in the region where your country is settled. So for example, if you play Holland, you might have as your goal to unite the low countries. So that's something that you can do, see the region and just try to go for that and limit yourself. There are certain bonuses for controlling a region. You might be able to form an empire. Like if you control the Scandinavia, Scandinavian area, you might be able to actually form the Scandinavian nation, all that kind of stuff. But uh, it's the least important of these map modes. So once you've selected the country that you want to play, you jump into options to fully customize your gameplay experience. Difficulty, I'm just going to go through these real quick. Difficulty, if you go for lower difficulties, your nation will get some bonuses and the AI nations will be more forgiving towards you. If you go for higher difficulties, the AI will get bonuses and they will be more aggressive towards you. Lucky Nations is there to simulate the development of great powers which actually occurred during that time period and if you go for historical then hist nations that did well in this period of time will also get the bonuses like france england poland muscovy all these nations you can turn that off or you can turn it on to random so random nations get that bonus but it does only apply to ai countries so a player nation will never be a lucky nation um, this is not really important, Terra Incognita in the lobby. I mean, kind of, if you play with Random New World, that is something that you want. Dynamic province names, they can be spelled in your nation's um, spelling, like certain regions, for example, over here in the area between Poland and Germany. They do have German names. And if they are being held by a German country, they will have German names. And then if they get conquered by Poland, they will have their, their proper Polish names, stuff like that. This is actually pretty nice. This is show monthly tax income. So every month that ticks over, you will have small numbers fly up uh, from each province showing you how much you made in that province. Can be kind of useful in the beginning to see like the importance of your countries. Color owned wastelands will basically just, for example, um, Make the world look a little bit nicer. If someone controls everything around the Sahara or let's say you control all of Australia, then the wasteland that doesn't really belong to your country will still be colored in your nation's color. I, I leave that on because it's actually fun. Then we have exclaves use region names. So for example, if I go ahead as Venice and I conquer a bunch of Mamluks, then it's going to be called um, Venetian Egypt or something like that, which is kind of nice. Um, no limits on idea groups. That's a pretty important one. And normally in the game, you are kind of forced to um, pick idea groups in a bit of a balanced way. So you can't just stack all military ideas. You have to like take an admin and then either take a military or diplom diplomatic idea group. Um, I turn this off because I find it a little bit restricting, um, but you can play however you want. You can go for fantasy random new world. So this will give native empires like... Um, the Yom's Vikings that settled America will suddenly pop up if you go for a random new world in the world generation. And then show start screen. That is a screen that will give you some information about the country that you play, its mechanics, all that kind of stuff. I recommend turning that on because it's actually useful information. And that's it for the options so far. The last option that I want to talk about is the random new world button, which you have if you own the Conquest of Paradise DLC. You got to decide if you want to go for a historical North and South America, or if you actually want to generate a random new world, which I've already done over here. Historical re Europeans did not know what they would find when they s sailed forth um, 4092. And this is what you can simulate with this. So if you click that, it, it takes a while, generates a random new world. And now we can have a look at it. No more colonizing with hindsight and your geographical knowledge. Instead, you get some randomly generated stuff. Can be a big continent, can be some smaller ones like over here. These nations get automatically generated. Um, sometimes you can have fantasy nations up here and uh, there's a southern continent down here. Very interesting. You would actually be able to sail right away to China and Japan instead of having to go through Cap Horn. So that can give your game some more replayability should you want it. An additional option for starting the game 
is the Custom Nation option that has been introduced if you own the El Dorado DLC. And that uh, is activated by going into Options and going for Custom Setup. So we were in the General tab for now, and now we go into Custom. And this allows you to change your difficulty. The number behind this is the points value. So if on Very Easy, you get 800 points. On Easy, 400. On Normal, 200. On Hard, 100. You can randomize various things like the um, distribution of taxes and manpower across the, the provinces in the world. You can actually go for flat values. So each province has the same 111 um, tax and uh, manpower value, which is kind of interesting if you just want to mix your game up. Um, you can have nations just randomly scrambled over the world, and you can only you can also only populate it by player created custom nations, which is also interesting. Um, just for sprucing things up, we can allowing nations to to the save game if you want to, yes or no, and you can go for dynamic random nations. So. You can have just randomly generated nations all across the world, depending on what uh, province they spawn from. Um, what you want if you go for a for custom nation is just selecting that and leaving the rest on normal values. That should be fine. And then to start your custom nation, you click down here on custom nation. And let's say we want to start in Munich. So we'll click on München. And uh, now this gives us München with all the options that we have. So we can go for a different emblem. We can make our flag different. Um, tons and tons of different emblems are available here. We can change our color on the map. As you see, our province color changes. Pretty important. If you want to be able to see that, you can have nation name, nation objective, change all that kind of stuff. You can go for a bunch of random options here as well for your flag. Let's choose... Yeah, why not? Let's go for the imperial... Munich area. You can change your ruler, make a male, female, give them various traits, um, generate your and you can see that everything will will cost you points. You can see the total amount of points that you've used. We can push that up to the max, and you can see that it costs us uh, quite a few points to have just to, to start with a godlike ruler. You can also reduce their age, and that costs points as well because that reduces the chance for them to die you can go for positive negative traits that costs you something um you can um go for your consort if you have rights of man that is another dlc otherwise you won't have consorts in the game and then you can change your government you can change your main culture your starting province will always have your main culture the rest will not and then you can also change your government rank all that kind of good stuff Go for various ideas, various traditions, so you basically can completely customize your nation. If you want to add more provinces, you can see that I do that over here, just adding nations by clicking on them, and I can also unadd them or remove them from my custom nation. So that's actually a pretty fun way. Um, I've played a couple of very interesting custom nations. So, for example, you could think about bringing the Joms Vikings back by giving them the island of Rügen and the province of Stralsund or doing just doing wacky stuff, fun stuff with the custom nation generator. Thanks for watching this part of the EU4 Academy. The Academy is an in-depth video tutorial series aimed at helping more people enjoy one of the best grand strategy games out there. If you found it helpful, then please consider leaving a like so that I can show up in search results and help even more people. If you want to learn more about EU4, then check the playlist. The link is in the description or have a look at my Let's Play content. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. I'll do my best to answer them. Cheers.